Hey everyone, Mafia306 here, and this is the first video in the calculus video series in which I will go step by step on how to teach you how to do calculus. And th this video series is especially made for uh, a couple of people that I'm going to school with, but hopefully my goal is that others will find these videos helpful as well. Uh, what these videos are is it's a series of um, instructional how-to videos, how to tackle basically any kind of calculus problem. It's instructional, I work out example problems, and you know, hopefully everyone will enjoy that sort of thing. Uh, what I expect of you if you're watching this, um, really all I expect is that you... I mean, I'm not going to give out homework assignments or anything, but as far as the math background, I expect that you can manipulate functions, that you can add functions together, that you can take the function of another function, that you can find the inverse of a function, that you can uh, use translations, transformations, rotations, etc. to derive new, fr new functions from old ones. Uh, I assume that you know basic trigonometry, you know, right triangle trigonometry, uh, that you know the sine of 30 degrees, 45 degrees, cosine of 60 degrees, 90 degrees, 135 degrees, and, you know, and so on, and that you know your basic trigonometric identities, you know, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, things like that. So this video is just going to be sort of an introduction and motivation on how to approach calculus. Um, and calculus really grew out of two uh, seemingly different, but in actuality very closely related problems, in the sense that they're almost that they are inverse problems. Um, and in order to go over the origins of calculus, we have to go back around 2,000 years to the ancient Greeks. Now, the ancient Greeks uh, concerned themselves with computing areas. Um, one of the biggest ones was computing the areas of a circle. Now, of course today we know that the area of a circle is pi r squared. But the Greeks went about calculating areas a different way. They used uh, what's now known as the method of exhaustion, in which they would inscribe polygons, here a square, here a hexagon, and they would find the area of those polygons inside the circle, which they knew how to calculate. And then to approximate the area of the circle, they would let the number of the sides of the polygon go to infinity. So 4 for the square, then 6 for the hexagon, then they might do 8 for an octagon, then they might do 12 for a dodecagon, and so on. Um, and then the other sort of interesting thing that comes out of this problem is say that we've got a function here and we want to calculate the area under the curve and one of the ways that we could do that is to put a series of triangle or rectangles underneath the curve and calculate those areas as approximations and then let the number of the rectangles go to infinity and in each case we come up with the fact that the area is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the area found by using an n-sided polygon up here or n number of rectangles down here. So the other problem is, and now this problem is about 2,000 years old, the area problem. Now the other half of the equation is the tangent problem, which actually is relatively new compared to the area problem although the tangent problem is still about 400 years old. And uh, it grew out of the study of polynomials in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. And the initial problem was, you know, say we've got a, a polynomial, this would be a third degree polynomial here, cubic equation, and we want to know exactly where the graph turns around here, as you can see. We want to know exactly where it turns around. And how do we know 
that it turns around at that point? Well, uh, we know that it turns around at the point where the slope of a tangent line to the polynomial equals zero. And for here, if we want, if we're just given a polynomial and we want to find the slope of the tangent line at p, then you see that we can estimate it by taking the slope of a tangent line at a point q and then allowing q to get closer and closer to the point p. And you can see that the slope of the tangent line gets closer and closer and closer to the slope of the tangent line at p as q approaches p. And in this case, we can write that the slope of a tangent line at p is equal to the limit as the point p q approaches p of the slope of the tangent line at q. So I know this all seems very vague and abstract right now, but it's really not. And so you can also see that limits play a very prominent and almost ubiquitous role in calculus. So first we will address the tangent problem. Um, but before we even do that, then, you know, we will address the issue of limits because limits come up everywhere in calculus. Calculus, uh, it's not like algebra where you have fixed quantities. Calculus deals with the values of certain variables or quantities as they approach other quantities or values. Um, and so that's the reason for doing limits. And as you'll see, uh, the first part uh, with the area problem leads to integral calculus, and the second part with the tangent problem leads to differential calculus, and we will cover differential calculus first, and then integral calculus. So I hope you guys look forward to learning this, and I look forward to making these videos and teaching you guys, and... Um, yeah, just let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any comments, inputs, complaints. And I'm sorry if the audio is a little bit choppy because my computer is acting up. But hopefully I will have that resolved in the very near future. So thank you for watching.